Hello all, welcome back. So today we will be having the lecture session on the serial communication interface between microprocessor and any of the peripheral devices that supports the serial communication. So we have discussed about the general purpose input output, uh, which is more of uh, a generic uh, interface will be more of a single bit input output and you can obviously combine the different pins to come up with a multi bit uh, input output option and it's of course the simplest of all the interfaces then we discussed in detail about interrupts then about timers and this one is sort of uh, slightly different uh, and it is more in line with GPIO and now we will talk about multi-bit communication, how is it possible and as the name suggests it is more serial in nature and we will discuss why it is uh, serial. So uh, as we think about communication protocols, um, uh, there are two options possible. One is uh, parallel and the other one is of course the serial option. So you see uh, the parallel option is something like this. Let's say I want to communicate an 8-bit output uh, to a uh, uh, sensor or I want to receive an 8-bit output from a sensor. Then it looks something like this. So the first uh, bit is hardwired. So this is a real physical wire which connects out 0 to in 0 and so on, out 7 to in 7. And obviously there can be a clock or uh, in most of the time there is a clock. And that is also connected from the input to the output. So everything goes parallel in one clock cycle. The data is transferred from the output to the input. It's fine. It's very good. And from a, a speed of a speed perspective, this is uh, very, very good. But when we consider the complexity, we need eight wires. And now you think about 16 bit transmission. You need 16 by wires. So it just increases with the number of bits that you want to transmit. The complexity is enormous. And the number of pins that an IC uh, or a chip or a system on chip has is pretty limited. As we discussed before, even our uh, my freedom board or even our microprocessor unit, many pins are multiplexed. That is because you don't have those many pins which can be dedicated, right? And then you can forget about a parallel protocol. But in earlier machines, in uh, old uh, desktop systems, at least if you if you have uh, one of those at your home. Please have a look, there will be a parallel port and printing in fact started uh, with us parallel port to start. With. Nowadays you won't see that, it's just disappeared even from uh, desktop machines. But it is an interesting way actually to communicate. Of, of course it's a high speed uh, interface. Now comes to the serial part. So essentially you, what you do is if you want to transmit an 8-bit data, you have to essentially serialize them and then transmit one bit at a time. It's something like this. So the order of transmission can be like the most significant bit comes out first or the least significant bit comes out first is uh, most of the time controlled by you. But um, essentially it transfers to something like this. So you transfer the first bit, second bit, third bit and so on. The last bit comes and each bit is transferred with the help of a clock. So we will talk about some protocols where you don't need a clock essentially but um, let's assume there is a clock so you just need seven clock cycles to transmit the uh, sorry eight clock cycles to transmit the data compared to a parallel case where you need just one clock cycle but here you need only one wire here you need eight or in fact nine wires including the clock here you need two wires and sorry for that so two wires here uh, nine wires here that's the computational or or the area complexity part of it but uh, eight cycles here and one cycle here is the, uh, the computation of the speed of operation part of it. So obviously this is a trade-off that as an engineer you have to make. You want to go fast or you want to reduce on the area of or the footprint of implementation. This challenge will always end up the power uh, speed trade-off or the area speed trade-off will always end up and uh, that's where the engineers are always. So in this uh, session, as I said, uh, parallel uh, protocol is sort of outdated and we will not talk about it. We will focus more and more on these serial protocols and serial protocol is all over around you. This picture actually shows that. 
So this is a parallel uh, uh, interface cable that uh, uh, it's sort of uh, fastly disappearing now. You don't have it, uh, but if you have it, uh, have it actually a fortunate because it's like a uh, antique for me, right? <laughs> So coming back to the serial option, these uh, two are very popular, the Ethernet and the USB. Those are the modern day serial protocols. The one that uh, is fast disappearing from uh, laptops at least is uh, the serial protocol. Don't get confused uh, with this one with the VGA. It looks similar, but it's not. This is the serial protocol, the RS-232-1 they call. So uh, this is... Um, uh, uh, I would say one of the most standard protocols from a microcontroller perspective. USB and uh, Ethernet are generally not used when, when we talk about an embedded system. When we talk about laptops or uh, higher order systems, definitely they are there. But typically a microprocessor, microcontroller, you do communication or interfacing with peripherals through uh, lower level uh, serial protocols. That's what we are going to discuss in this lecture. So just a comparison, that's where we end the comparison between parallel and serial. Of course, uh, cost and weight, uh, it's important to see that uh, parallel will have less wires. Obviously, the area implementation will be low cost and uh, smaller connectors, of course, compared to serial. So obviously, cost and weight, uh, parallel has a uh, better uh, uh, to serial because for serial you can uh, do it with two two wires one for the data and one of one for the clock whereas parallel you need so many wires and associated circuits so definitely parallel is going to lose in that aspect so reliability um, so uh, interestingly parallel will have a lot of crosstalk because imagine you might be studying that in electromagnetic theory, there's a lot of magnetic field associated with uh, wires when they transmit current. So a lot of crosstalk uh, possibilities are there, interference possibilities are there, and hence parallel communication is uh, uh, less reliable com compared to a serial communication protocol. Clockwise, of course, parallel wins it hands down. Uh, serial is uh, really slow compared to parallel, but there is a possibility that you increase the clock frequency but uh, then you can argue, <laughs> parallel will always be fast. That's the truth. But uh, that's a trade-off that you have to uh, survive on, right? And uh, for a serial one, because most of the time your data is parallel, so when you want to use a serial interface, you need a serial to parallel, so parallel to serial interfacing. That's an extra overhead. So that will add on to your cost as well. But Maybe because of this uh, overall weight and cost and reliability, parallel has just disappeared from the scene. And of course, the scalability issue, because you can't just go on having parallel option all the way, right? Because it is proportional to the number of bits that you want to touch. So moving on, uh, we'll just concentrate on serial communication from now onwards. Uh, if you want to see the serial communication is broadly divided into two classes, I would say. And that is for matter a digital circuit is also broadly classified into these two aspects. One is synchronous, the other one is the asynchronous option. Of course, in synchronous uh, serial transmission, the name suggests something is synchronous, so it is synchronous with a clock. There is a common clock, please note that there is a common clock shared between the sender and the receiver. So you need a transmitter, you need a receiver, and the clock is shared between them. So that's very important aspect. So there is a clock line going from the transmitter to the receiver. So very, very important. Then it is uh, more efficient because one wire is dedicated for data transfer and the other one is uh, for the clock. But of course costly because you need another extra clock wire. And asynchronous is just the opposite of that. There is no clock. So there should be some synchronization, right? Otherwise uh, there is a problem. So how that happens? There's a lot of handshaking goes between the uh, transmitter and the receiver. So we will uh, discuss about that when we discuss in detail one of the asynchronous protocol and you have special bits which are assigned to actually synchronize the transmission, particularly errors for example. You have to see whether errors are uh, there or not, right? Because you can have data loss or uh, some interference which can correct the data. So moving on, uh, so this is a uh, illustration, I would say high level illustration of uh, these two aspects. So email can be thought of as an asynchronous case because 
uh, when you are sending it, you are, the receiver need not be there to listen to you, right? So it receives, whenever the receiver logins to the uh, email, then only he receives it. So that's the concept, even though it may be in the server. And it is asynchronous. They, both of them need not be there at the same time. But synchronous, the classic example is a phone call where you need a receiver to be at the same time with you. Uh, otherwise, voicemail, you can treat it as an asynchronous option, right? So that's a high level illustration for you. And a more technical description is something like this. For synchronous, you transmit the data and there is a clock to get the synchronization done. For receiver, you need to identify the start, the stop, and then in between the data. So we'll discuss about this in detail. And this just to give a feel for you. So asynchronous is without clock. Synchronous is with clock. So if there is no clock, there should be some way to synchronize. And that happens through a handshaking thing. And we'll discuss that in detail. Okay. Moving on, um, another type that you want to classify the serial communication other than the clock part is this simplex versus uh, half duplex versus duplex. Okay. So as the name suggests, simplex is a, a one-way traffic. Okay. So uh, uh, something like you have a transmitter, you have a receiver, and it only goes from transmitter to receiver. The other way is not at all possible. That is uh, a simplest way of communication and earlier communication uh, protocol was actually simplex okay. and nowadays uh, very very rare to have a simplex way because at least there will be a half duplex and uh, now you should understand what is half duplex because uh, there is a single line of communication between transmitter and receiver there may be something like this and um, uh, the same line can be used for communication from uh, device one to device two and at another point of time, it can also be used for communication from device two to device one. Simultaneously not possible. At one point of time, communication is simplex, but it is possible to have another simplex uh, communication between device two to device one. So half duplex is something like two simplexes okay, at different instances of time. And um, uh, you can think of, uh, I don't know how many of you played like this. So we used to play like uh, you put uh, some stick uh, in the matchbox and the long string between these two matchboxes and we will stand some meters away and if I communicate through that uh, to the other side you will always uh, hear and then the other person can actually only listen then the next time I will listen and the other person can actually talk and this actually is an illustration of wave transmission as well along the string sound transmission along the string you would say so interesting stuff the walkie talkies uh, you can have a uh, half duplex, that's a classic example again, right? Communication is possible both ways, but one at a time, right? And then the most common of uh, modern day is the duplex part, where uh, it is something like this. Both communication is possible at the same time, and uh, uh, we'll talk about some of them in our discussion. So there is a dedicated line uh, between the transmitter to the receiver from device one to device two, and at the same time transmitted to receiver from device 2 to device 1. So we'll study about these things in detail when we discuss about some of the protocols. So we discussed about types of serial communication. We started off with uh, C, uh, synchronous with us versus asynchronous. That's one option. The other option is the simplex, half duplex and full duplex or uh, duplex option. And another one, this is as an electrical engineer, as, as a pure electrical engineer or electronics engineer, this is one of the key important factor which uh, I don't know whether you studied about differential amplifiers. If not, you will study at some point of time. The, the, this, this is very, very interesting stuff. If not thought about this. So there are two ways that I can transmit a voltage from one, one location to the other. One is actually a single ended signaling. And in that case, um, in both, both the things are grounded and everything is with reference to this single ground. Whatever you measure, the, the voltage in this line, is measured with respect to the common ground. So you see something like this, so a high value or a low value, okay? So something like this, we'll come to this, so say noise can come, some interference noise, and it appears like a notch, notchy noise here. And uh, this noise will, ha will have a serious implication in the, in the receiver because it may treat as a high value here because if you see zero volt as is, uh, is your threshold, this guy is going above zero. So then this can be treated as a data, something like one here, zero in this location and sudden one here and then zero in this location, which is absolutely wrong. So this can be a serious problem in many cases, uh, particularly in something like this single wire transmission. We call it as 
single ended signaling the typical case that we see in many of the protocols and many of the, uh, the, the interfaces is a differential signaling where you have two wires twisted pair of wires this is what you see in most of the cables that you see it's very very reliable so you have a negative and positive potential here and both will have a common ground the negative and positive with reference to this common ground and uh, in this case for example so d plus is something like this and d minus is just the inverse of that the noise will get affected in both both the wires equally and the important thing is that this guy is always treating uh, when when you jet the output or when you use it for further processing you always do this way d plus minus d minus or it can be other way d minus minus d plus whichever way you take only difference will be the waveform gets inverted but the important aspect is that since these two noises which are getting induced in the individual lines equally they may get cancelled because you are subtracting and that is the beauty about this two wires are, or, or we call in electrical literature as differential signaling okay so if you see any of these terms synchronous asynchronous duplex half duplex simplex single ended signaling or differential signaling you should immediately uh, understand that this is what exactly happening and that's also important other than the types of classification that we're talking about okay so that's what we discussed about the serial communication now let's go to more details and uh, let's visit our favorite chart uh, again i hope everyone who's listening this should be able to explain this chart uh, in your own way so we have the software here you have the alu or the cpu hardware here which is the core then you have the bus and then you have the interface uh, controllers or registers or memory unit whatever you want to have then you have the pin layout where the multiplexing happens etc and then your external environment which is here so there are two routes that any of these peripheral devices can communicate to cpu the standard route is through the bus the advanced uh, peripheral or the advanced interfacing bus option the other option is through the interrupts right so all of these we discussed we discussed about the gpios we discussed about the timers in the previous lectures and now is our turn to visit this universal synchronous or synchronous receiver transmitter module and that's what is a most important thing which will communicate with your outside world okay we can communicate using gpio but there are limitations to it and this is the way you should overcome all almost all the limitations that a gpio has okay and the interesting thing is that this can also can communicate to your cpu through the normal bus architecture or normal bus way of doing or it can communicate through the interrupt way of doing okay and the way interrupt is enabled done configured is all similar to what we discussed in the previous class and then inside this module we are going to discuss in maybe we will cover in a single lecture or multiple lectures these three things i squared c which is integrated integ uh, inter circuit protocol integrated in the circuit which is a communication protocol or you can think of in the chip communication okay it's one of the most powerful and most dedicated uh, protocols actually uh, okay so let's go in details about uh, each one of these uh, three protocols uh, i squared c is one of them as i said spi serial peripheral interface and universal asynchronous receiver transmitter okay so these three protocols will be explained in detail and we will have a lab session dedicated to uart which is the most common of the three and uh, once you are doing that i i, I suggest you to also explore i squared c and spi because you will be using that in many times and in fact you have used it many times in arduino without knowing for example the wired h uh, that you include is actually i squared c protocol so if you're not done any analysis on that uh, before please go through it it's very interesting and the concepts will be very very clear if you go through how it works or how it gets executed in arduino for example even though we will be dedicating the thing or we will doing it only for freedom board it doesn't end there it is just an example to show how it works but definitely it is applicable to any microcontroller or any microprocessor that you will use at some point of some point in time okay so moving on um why so many types it's important point that as uh, before we go even discuss so one thing actually i want to highlight so this will not end with these three okay there are many tons of them usb ethernet jtag 
all these are part of the USART or serial communication. And uh, it's humanly impossible for us to actually study one after the other. So you will actually have to put some effort to learn other things by yourself. As and when you use it. But we will introduce to these three which are the basic. And then the advanced stuff you should be able to learn by your own. Okay. So why so many serial communications? That's important, right? So why we need to actually study them? Why so many are there? Why should not be only one serial communication? So one thing is that all these serial communications are driven by certain applications, by certain companies. So they have their own agenda to propagate. But it is up to us to choose one of them and go ahead with it, which suits our application and which suits our budget. For us. So these are sort of vague uh, criteria on choosing a particular serial communication. For example, how many wires uh, are required for transmission or reception? Uh, is it asynchronous or is it synchronous? How fast, that's important, right? How fast can it transfer data? So can it support more than two endpoints, two receivers? Can I, so that's also important because I, I may want to communicate to two, three, four, five hundred devices. So what is that? Uh, which protocol or which communication mode is that's best suited for me. Uh, think about the other way. I, I need to have two, three transmitters. Is it possible? So we call in communication the transmitters typically as master and the receivers typically as slave. But whichever convention do you want to use, you can use it. So can we have multiple transmitters? So that's another thing, that, right? You may want to have multiple transmitters in the picture. Think about a distributed uh, sensor network. You have multiple transmitters transmitting to a single slave, which is actually the microprocessor in this case. So uh, many use cases, right? How do we support the flow control? So um, do we have a control on the uh, flow, flow of data? So that's what I mean. Uh, how uh, shall we go with uh, most significant bit first or last significant bit first? Or shall I transmit eight bits at a time, 16 bits at a time? So this is very important. And then how does it handle errors or noise? That's also very important. For example, we just now saw differential signaling will have better immunity to noise than single ended signaling. So if I'm very much worried about noise, then I may go for differential, right? So that's a, that, that's an example I'm, I'm just giving. So these are typically guidelines and there is no end uh, or, or universal truth that this is the best. So many a times we'll end up in uh, having two or uh, three choices. And out of that, many of them we mostly will be driven by the cost, finally. So in this uh, lecture or in this next few lectures, we will uh, discuss in detail about UART, SPI and I squared C. Let's start with UART. Okay. So um, uh, I, would, I would like to acknowledge that uh, UART is a protocol developed by the Digital Equipment Corporation, which was very popular at some point of time during my childhood. Commonly known as Western Digital. They manufacture hard disk. You might have seen uh, the hard disks from them. Okay, so this is a protocol uh, introduced by them or popularized by them. And um, here uh, it's important that there is a, a, an extra hardware. I think it is common to all serial communication. I should not just be highlighting this from a perspective of UART, but you need a parallel to serial converter at the transmitter side. And similarly, a uh, serial to parallel converter at the receiver side. And that is done by UART, so you don't have to worry. So the UART module or the UART digital logic will take care of. So Freedom Board, will discuss in detail about that. Freedom Board has a circuit already ready for you. So all you need to do is configure some registers like we did it before for uh, timers or interrupts and it will do the job for you. Okay? And uh, uh, many people or many different standards, communication standards uh, later introduced by organizations like IEEE uh, that follows UART. And some of them, which is very popular, you might have definitely heard about this RS-232, the serial port that uh, laptops or desktops definitely use. RS-422 is another example. And RS-485, I have a small table coming up which distinguishes between these three in detail. So we'll discuss about them when we have that table. Okay, so these are some uh, communication standards which are based on the UART protocol or UART, UART communication interface. Okay. Uh, the universal designation, whatever the, the name universal, why universal here? It indicates the data format and transmission speeds are configurable 
and that uh, that the actual electrical signaling levels and methods such as all these are handled by a special driver circuit external to the unit so that means uh, this is sort of uh, an external circuit and you don't have to worry about that it will be already done for you in that perspective okay so this is the uh, the uh, comparison between these three rs232 422 and 485 in terms of uh, voltage signal level the maximum distance it can support maximum speed it can support remember this is a maximum okay so maximum doesn't mean the average so this is the the best possible case so this is sometimes fool you because if you go by it it will never achieve it it's a technically possible one but it never be achievable you should always go for an average value but typically unfortunately most of the the manufacturers specify it in terms of the maximum value so you have to leave with it so this uh, uh, is also important to note that and you will get gain more experience uh, as you gain more experience you will become more uh, more uh, uh, what you call expert in selecting all these and then number of devices supported per port that's also important right so rs232 is a very very small device typically for a laptop or a uh, desktop scenario and uh, typically the voltage range is uh, somewhere between plus 5 to plus 15 volt and that is, that may be the reason why it is disgraced uh, nowadays in laptops because uh, you need an smps sort of scenario to derive that minus 15 or a plus 15 volt right and uh, if you have such a thing in lap top it needs an additional circuitry power circuitry and it's not very uh, meaningful to do that and then uh, the maximum distance which is not very relevant most of the time because you are not going to draw a, a wire of over 100 feet but technically feasible 100 feet and uh, maximum speed of around 115 kilobits per second so it's mostly kilobits so it's, that's important thing to notice okay. so average i would say somewhere around 25 kilobits per second when we Uh, think about you want which is uh, not very extraordinarily high and uh, this one is one master one uh, slaves case and uh, typically laptop uh, you need only that one right so rs422 is uh, typically used in uh, very sophisticated uh, measurement systems in industries and all and it is differential and hence it is more robust to noise obviously more distance possible more speed possible and you can have a one master and 10 receivers in this case so some people argue and some people wrongly say that uart is actually one to one but that's wrong it is possible to have multiple uh, receivers so be careful in that rs232 is one to one but rs422 is not one to one okay and rs425 higher better and uh, more complex as you can see over here and multiple masters have a look at it multiple masters is possible okay so that's also important and somebody is very keen very interested please have a look at it please read through it if you have any questions doubts i am always open for discussion okay but this is out of our syllabus and out of our course and i don't want to dump everything to you whoever is interested please have a look at it instead i'm just throwing light i need not even discuss about any of this but it's important that you understand and if you i just say you are you may think about where is it applied okay you are make sense in a low end microcontroller the name itself but when we go about laptops desktops servers you need to understand about rs232 422 485 etc but all this will be based on a certain protocol which we will discuss in the next slide so you are protocol this is whichever is based on you are will have to follow this protocol whoever manufactures it whoever uses it this is the standard protocol you cannot violate from okay so each character or each data that you want to send is sent as a series of bits like this there will be a, a starting bit which is a logic law so typically the line of transmission we will discuss about that in detail next how is it done which will be always held high okay so there is a pull up register which ties this line to a high value okay so it's important that you issue a start bit basically you place a voltage into this line that's the meaning of it which makes it low okay so that's a very important aspect so there is always a logic low start bit and this this uh, high value will be there for a longer duration of time so that may be one of the reason why the the bit rate or the transmission rate is low or any order okay so to make to, to start the transmission the first important step is you have to issue a logic low start bit which put that line into 
a low state. Okay. The moment that is done, you can transmit your bits, usually seven or it can be eight. In this case, I'm showing a eight bit case. Okay. So the most important thing is that you are transmitting the uh, least significant bit first, then the last significant bit is the last. Okay. So that's done. The moment you are done that, there is a stop bit, which is actually the opposite of the start bit, which pulls the line irrespective of its previous bit to high and it keeps it for some duration of time. The stop bit need not be one, it can be multiple. Okay. So this is another case where I'm transmitting only seven bits, but then the last bit is actually something which is a parity bit, which you already uh, should be knowing by now because we had an exercise in, uh, in the lab. So parity is basically odd or even parity. So how do you do go about it? You count the number of ones in this uh, thing. Let's say bit zero to bit seven. And if the number of bits is odd, you treat it as odd parity. And if it is even, you treat it as even parity. Okay, so that's a name. So it is a, a error checking here. So this is very, very important because this is without clock. So you need to know that you are transmitting whatever you are transmitting is received well at the other side. Okay. So to ensure that you have, you can put a parity bit at the end. So that's the important thing. So logic low start bit, which pulls down the, uh, the data line to a low value. Then you're ready for transmission. Then you have a configurable number of bits, data bits. It can be seven. In the case of seven, there is a parity bit following. In the case of eight, there is no parity bit following. And it can be even five. In that case, you have more number of stop bits. Okay. So that's very rare, but five, because typically you want to pump in more data as possible so that you increase the bit rate or the board rate. Uh, by the way, have you heard about, I just want to divert a bit now. Have you heard about board rate? Right. So we'll come to that here. So board rate is uh, derived from communication where um, it is a group of bits because when you say a signal, a signal cannot be most of the time represented by one bit, right? It needs some amount of bits or some number of bits. So board rate typically means that number of bits, we call it as a signal uh, or a, or a, uh, what do you call yeah, it's a signal in communication. So that's a, a signal consists of certain number of bits and that contributes a board and number of bits transmitted per second. That word or, or that data transmitted per second is typically uh, implemented as board rate. But in this case, one bit is your uh, one signal because we are transmitting one bit at a time and board rate is actually bit rate itself. So it doesn't matter. It interchangeably used in this case. Okay, so uh, if it is... 7 bits will have a parity bit. If it is 8 bit, you will not have a parity bit. Irrespective of parity bit or there or not, you will have a stop bit, which will just make the line high and keep it for some duration of time. And then the, this is important because I'm transmitting the data, then I'm receiving the data, but both should be at a certain rate. Otherwise, I will miss it, right? How will I know that uh, this is my one bit duration? This is my another second bit duration. Because you need to know that, you need to know the bit rate. And that is actually typically you set by uh, setting the board rate. How many of you have used the uh, serial terminal in uh, a Windows or a Linux or a, uh, any environment? So when you set the serial terminal, you might have set the board rate. So that board rate is exactly the rate at which you are going to transmit the bits in this case. In this case. For example, a typical board rate is something like 9,600 uh, bits per second. Or it can be 11,500, sorry, uh, yeah, 11,000, sorry, yeah, 115200. You might have uh, heard about it, right? When you set the Arduino, for example, you set the uh, serial uh, board rate. So that's exactly the meaning of it, how fast you're transmitting it. Okay. So hope everyone understood this. Uh, in the case of UART, Everything is transmitted in this protocol. Okay, a low logic start bit followed by the data bit, which is eight or seven. If it is seven, there will be a parity bit. It can be five. In that case, you have more stop bits, and all these will be followed by a stop bit, which will put the data line back to high and keep it for some amount of time. Moving on, uh, just to see the hardware or the physical layout. This is how a serial uh, RS two thirty two looks like and these are the pins that uh, it is typically how uh, so these are the names for it so the pin number one which will be 
typically the data the data line i would say and pin number 2 and 3 uh, sorry 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 <laughs> a mistake here so dcd is uh, some data carrier detect okay so that is uh, which is an advanced uh, way of doing it so you can actually put some uh, carrier signal to it okay so that's not very widely used okay so uh, i don't know which way to put it because you have... so uh, <clears throat> this is the name comes from actually the old type of modern connection where we use a carrier to transmit the signal so dcd is typically to uh, ensure that there is a carrier always present which is very redundant uh, in our age so we will never uh, do that but dcd will ensure that uh, uh, the presence of a carrier if it is not there it will become zero and then typically a modem disconnects that's what uh, happens but we will not go into that because you not studied about uh, communication here so maybe it makes more sense once you uh, study about communication but we can you can safely ignore it because the that's not very important in this point of time so these two are important rxd and txd those are the receive data and transmit data so the transmit data of the master will get connected to the rxd pin of the slave so how, that's how we typically do it and then um, this dtr and dsr cts rts is all to ensure that uh, your data is ready for transmission and the receiver is ready for reception and so on so it works uh, so explanation is here uh, these two are very should be straight forward to you so rts output signal to indicate readiness in receiving data usually connected to the cts line of the downstream device okay so uh, downstream is something like uh, master part and uh, upstream is what you receive right so rts is the receive part which will be connected to the cts of the transmitter okay? and similarly this is the other way which uh, says the uh, it is okay to transmit the data okay so that that comes actually so all you need to uh, do when you use this is to follow this and then you are set for the transmission and this is an example uh, i would say so maybe a little vague uh, if i explain all these at this point that's why i didn't spend much of time but uh, when you do the lab exercise on you what you will become very very clear about it and should not be any confusion about it okay. so going forward um, this is how the uh, transmit uh, uh, of two examples two two uh, letters i would say or uh, if you go back and see the ascii table ascii uh, table you can actually see what is 0x32 corresponds to and 0x3 c corresponds to so this is how it looks like in the case of a uh, ur transmission okay? and uh, you will transmit first uh, so this is the time axis from uh, minus to uh, zero here so you have the start bit and then this is 0100 uh, 1100 okay so how does it work out let's see okay so let's turn it okay so uh, what exactly it means actually is uh, 0x32 let's see how it works so uh, in the case of you are the least significant is transmitted first so if i see here 2 is nothing but uh, 0010 right so that's what the opposite of it happens so 0 0010 happens there and then 3 comes 0011 so that's the way it transmits start bit of course and stop bit and corresponding signature you can see over here this is a realistic case uh, and we capture it from the oscilloscope similarly here uh, 3c so the least significant has to go first c is nothing but 1100 so that's what happens and then 0011 transmits so okay so 0011100 is the order if you go from most significant bit the least significant bit. always care about the start bit and the stop bit okay and in this case the data rate is somewhere around 9600 which transmits if i if i see one by of this value we'll get somewhere around uh, 0.104 milliseconds which is the duration of a bit in this case
In this case, we are following the simple protocol of one start bit, one stop bit, and eight bits. So no parity here, and the baud rate is exactly this. And coming back to uh, our particular board, okay. So this is the transmit, and uh, this is the receive. So I'll just briefly explain. Uh, we'll not go into details of this because uh, this is a circuit which is already done for you, and all you need to understand is actually to configure these registers. And uh, when you do it in the lab, it becomes very clear. But let's actually quickly look at it. So we have the bus here. So from the bus, obviously, you have to load the desired data. This data can come from a memory location or from the CPU directly, and this will be loaded into a register, which is the UART D register. Okay. And then from this register, you need to load it into a shift register, and from this shift register, it will go out to the serial uh, line, which is the TXD line, which is shown here. So this from this register, the data has to be serialized. So this is parallel; it will get converted to serial in this register. The start bit is here. The least significant bit from the data is sitting here. and then of course the most significant bit is here this can be coming from a parity as well and then the stop bit is also here the clock is generated here so the clock you can select whether you have you want to use an internal clock or clock from outside it's all in your hand and then the clock speed actually uh, can be changed to set the desired board speed okay so board uh, rate basically is fixed if you see the serial uh, serial terminal you you can see that there is set of speeds that you can uh, uh, set it something like 9600 and so on one lakh 15200 and so on so so many options are possible that is actually set by this particular thing and uh, there is an option at 16 to ensure the We said baud rate between nine thousand six hundred and all the way up to whichever is maximum possible. Okay, so that is set uh, basically using the registers in a similar manner that we set the registers of an interrupt. Okay, similar. So once the baud uh, rate is set up, the data will be transmitted in the TXD line in that particular rate. Okay, so there is no clock line. Remember that the only thing that you have control is that way the rate at which the transmission is done. and then all these data will go through the parity and the parity will count the number of bit so through the parity only the bit goes from 7 to 0 the shift direction is also shown so it will ignore the start bit and the stop bit it will only care about these 7 uh, bits okay and then based on this parity you can enable the parity using pe here pe is nothing but parity enable and pt is basically the parity type is it odd parity or the even parity that you can set it so based on that the corresponding uh, 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 parity will be set okay and uh, then this will be actually shifted in the forward direction and then based on the rate that it goes it just gets transmitted and you can actually invert the data which is very rarely used using this tx invert option which is basically just inverting the whatever data is there using a zor gate okay? and that's transmitted and then um, there is something else which is transmitted to the receiver which is actually the baud rate related uh, thing which is important right because it needs to know what baud rate it is actually transmitted so there is a loop control which is actually transmitted to the receiver even though we say that there is no dedicated line so this is actually signifying the other connections like the cts rts etc that is equivalent to this loops connection here okay so there is no clock line transmitted but there is some sort of uh, synchronization along with the baud rate information which is passed to the receiver if the receiver is not setting up the correct baud rate you will end up in messing the data you can easily try it out you can try that in the arduino so you try to enable the arduino some of those examples and change the baud rate to a different baud rate other than what is the desired baud rate and you can see that it disappears and whatever the meaningful value disappears and it starts jumbling throughout i mean your data appears to be like some random numbers or words coming out okay and then another important aspect which we will not be discussing in much detail is this bottom part so as i said 
there are two ways that uh, the ur transmit or any serial in the in communication transmission can take place one is through the conventional way of putting the data into the bus the other way is actually an interrupt based approach where you can trigger the transmission reception everything through an interrupt way of doing it okay so moment your data is ready for transmission it will trigger an interrupt and then your peripheral device uh, can actually receive or transmit the data based on that so we'll discuss about dma at some point of time so this is actually some way of transferring data from a peripheral to an another peripheral without explicitly coming to memory so direct memory transfer is a abbreviation that dma stands for so that's the meaning of it so we'll discuss that at some point of time we can safely ignore it it's slightly complicated to uh, actually set up the interrupt way of doing the ur transmission but it's not very difficult also so i encourage you to do that but in our lab exercise we will be strictly restricting to the easier case of uh, polling type okay so where you use the best for transmission and reception okay. and then uh, similar to transmit you will have a receive module okay so this is exactly opposite of that you have the uh, line which is the txd line which is coming and sitting in this uh, this point so similarly the synchronization part is coming here so this is the pin which receives the data serially again that opposite of the tx inversion you see here the moment uh, the data comes it comes to this register and gets accumulated in this shift register and becomes parallel and then of course it will be conveyed to the data register to the bus and then you can do whatever with the data similar thing of clock setting baud rate setting is here as well and then another thing is basically the uh, the the parity checking so that actually takes out all the seven and based on the eighth bit you will basically check for parity if there is a problem with parity it immediately triggers an error interrupt request and similarly it is checking for some other error options also any of these is not satisfying it will trigger an error interrupt and the receive interrupt also is uh, possible by similar way as i was discussing the other case based on uh, uh, certain configurations it's, it's possible to make the communication with the when they reward communication as an interrupt based rather than a polling based communication okay so in general uh, the freedom board that we have has three uart options uart 0 to uart 2 and uh, this as i said can be enabled using uh, polling or interrupt both options are uh, there so let me just uh, okay so one small point here uh before we wind up the session on uh, uart and possibly we will wind up the lecture as well we will discuss about the i squared c and spi in the next lecture so uart clock setting is uh, expanded here whatever you see over here this small portion is expanded and shown over here and uh, you can see there is a factor of over sampling ratio okay. so based on that your board rate is set now going back uh, to your friend this uh, thing the, the bible of what you want to look at the data sheet so if you go here on the left hand side you have the uh, spi uh, sorry the uart option so if you go here you can see three options for uart uart 0 and uart 1 and uart 2 so let's click on uart 0 so all the things are explained in detail here and i suggest you to actually read through rather than just listening to my lecture and all so this clearly shows how the things are done in a very brief manner okay the same thing that we were discussing and these are the details of each and every register so how to use it to configure the ur transmission okay so please go through this and make sure you understand everything before doing the lab exercise so i'm leaving it to you Uh, if you have any questions doubts you, we can always clarify it okay so that uh, comes to the end of uh, the uart and maybe i will uh, uh, stop here and we will discuss on the spi and the uh, i squared c aspect in the next lecture okay so thank you for listening and see you in the next lecture